Hey everyone, welcome to day four, week six. Uh, today we're gonna keep on with our key uh, theme week, but we're gonna do something a little bit different, which is we're actually gonna uh, sacrifice the contrast that we've kept with the other paintings. So today we're gonna minimize the contrast, which means that our every single value in our painting is gonna be bunched up. The uh, differences between light and dark are gonna be very, very, very small. And to do this, because I'm trying to do this every week, I don't know if I can do this every week, but I'm trying to, uh, we go back to the uh, four color palette. So I think it's gonna be perfect for this exercise. Again, we sacrifice contrast, we bunch everything up together like in the midtones, and I think it's gonna be a really nice painting. I started with my lining brush again, and I don't know why, it, it, it doesn't seem like I, learn from my past experiences, but I wanted to have a tight drawing, a kind of nice tight drawing to start with. And I always trust my drawing skills with this brush, but <laughs> as you'll see in a, in a minute, it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating when I try to commit to line work, to very, very kind of specific line work in such a premature stage of a painting. I just grabbed a cheap synthetic flat and went to town and I was like, okay, forget about those marks. They did give me a big idea of where I wanted to put the figure in terms of the composition, but this was a, a lot more helpful. Just grabbing a paper towel and lifting up confusing paint that had all those drawing marks and just wiping out a better drawing for that head than I could have ever done with my lining brush. So don't think that because you can make a really fine mark that it's gonna naturally be a better drawing tool than a tool that will make very broad marks. Uh, in this case, if I had you know, been stubborn and kept just whacking at that very, very tight drawing, it would have gotten me nowhere and it would have conditioned my painting in a terrible way and it would have made it just super tight and just making fresh decisions on top of that bad drawing would have been very very hard and because i noticed that decision with the paper towel had been so advantageous for for me for what i was trying to do with this painting which is you're going to see in a, in a second it's all about atmosphere um, I realized no, I I can't think about detail. This was it was it was a bad decision at first, but it was a decision that I could learn from, which I'm always grateful for those. And what it taught me was that there's no way that this particular painting could rely on these very sharp drawing marks. Like I had to take that out of my arsenal at least for today. I love doing those marks sometimes during an Ala Prima session. Uh, many, many times in a second layer of painting just to reestablish my drawing. I love to bring that stage of drawing onto a blocked-in painting, but this wasn't the work to do it. Even though it made me feel a little insecure, like for example, this moment of the painting, you can really feel it. Uh, it became almost like patchwork, and I had to trust myself and trust the belief that you can also understand and find drawing through shapes of colors. And as soon as I understood that, I was like, okay, we're gonna go for that. You know, that's what the painting is telling me to do. And this is something that's super, super important. I understand that a painting is this inanimate act uh, that we're doing, but in truth, I really feel that a painting almost is conscious about what the artist intends is, but is also conscious about the artist's limitations and about the nature of what is being painted. I know that I'm giving like <laughs> sentience to a painting, but I'd like to believe that that's what's happening. And I think that because I believe in that, then I'm always willing to have a conversation with my painting, to be listening attentively to my painting. And what usually happens is that I try to impose what I want to do onto my painting. You know, I want to impose my experience and my knowledge and the clarity that I think I possess. And then the painting tells me, well, you wanted to do this, but this is what's actually happening. 
it's almost like life. We, we can have uh, a very clear objective in life. We can prep everything up, just think that everything is going to work out great, and then life happens. And then, you know, this thing that is out of our control happens. And I do think that while there's many, many painters that seem in absolute control of what they're doing, and historically there's painters that are just incredible at understanding the formal part of painting, I really do believe there is an aspect of painting where you don't really have complete control of it. You don't, because these are, you know, organic materials. These are things that at some point were alive, or if you want to really believe it, they are alive. So much so that they degrade and everything just gets older and oil shrinks and yellows and um, color is affected by light. Um, so I, I really do believe that we as painters, we as artists can only go up to a certain point and then we have to stop and look at what's going on and say, okay, I have to reassess now and I have to understand that maybe this is pulling me elsewhere. I know that a lot of people don't like that argument because they want to feel like they can be in absolute control of what they're doing. And if they have a message, they want to believe that they can communicate it at their most effective manner um, when they exercise the most control. I believe that painting is similar to any act that happens in this universe where you have to release the idea of control that you think you have over anything. Things happen in this universe that we have absolutely no control over. And I know this seems like a little haphazard, but it's not. It really isn't. I, I really feel it's almost like this dance between you and painting. And when that happens, you are actually open to learning from your painting, which is pretty amazing. But again, this is what I choose to believe. Other people just want to learn technique and gather a ton of experience by painting a ton of paintings and knowing how to hone that technique to levels that are quite remarkable. And then they just want to do paintings. Then they feel like their job, now that they have amassed this incredible amount of experience and knowledge of how painting behaves, now their job is to say through painting and to make paintings that can wow the world and that's going to be their legacy. I, I feel that painting is a far more grounded thing. It's like any act that any human being can do in this universe and it just it speaks about you kind of setting things in motion but then things happen. <laughs> I guess that's the the uh, best way to do it and I think that when we do that uh, painting becomes something that is is alive. It's not just this thing we do. It's not our job. We don't just wake up and stand in front of our easel or sit down in front of our table and then just paint and our day just becomes the execution of paintings. That's about it. You know, we start something and then we finish it. I think that's a very, very boring, sad life, to be honest. I think I choose to be wowed by painting and feel wonder you know, through painting. And I think if these first 20 some odd years have been proof of anything is that this is not going to change for the next 20 years, hopefully for the next 40, hopefully for the next 60 years. Um, no, I don't want to paint till I'm 100. That's crazy. That's only like Titian. I really do believe that I have to be open to understanding when the painting is sending me signals. It's trying to tell me, hey, don't paint me this way. Don't impose your manners onto me in this way. What I'm asking you to do is this. And I always have like open eyes, open ears to, to all those things. Again, this painting was about just big, big masses, big atmosphere, losing things. And the thing is about us, we are very, very afraid. All of us representational painters are very afraid when we lose our drawing, when we lose the uh, kind of the limits, the, the frontiers of one object and another. And, and those borders give us security. They, they, they give us clarity. So when we lose them, we feel like we are just in this swamp that we don't really know what to do. And I like that. I like that sense, again, of urgency, of saying, wow, this is, this is, uh, this is almost like unknown territory. And we are charting it as we put these marks of color down. And I, I really, really like that. And this painting was asking that aspect of me as a painter 
to be present. It was asking me to be reliant on this ability to understand color as my compass. It was easier. I'm not going to say it was easy, but it was easier because I was using a, a four color palette again. That's why my greens are gray greens. My purples are purple gray. So those, those are sacrifices that were done in order to gain the bigger sense of atmosphere that is present throughout the painting. And while I was doing it, it was absolutely impossible not to think about Gwen John. Gwen John is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite painters. By the way, this is not like a thing, but women painters, my God, they absolutely kicked ass. And I'm very, very glad that we live at a time now that we can honor them and discover and celebrate, not discover as in, you know, if it wasn't, it, it wasn't there, but make visible their work and celebrate how really, really good they were. And Gwen John's case, it's the same story that many, many women painters had to go through in the 19th and 20th century, which was that uh, they were overshadowed by, by male artists. In Gwen's case, her brother Augustus was a really, really, really good uh, portrait painter. There's, there's this awesome painting that they both did of Augustus's uh, wife, uh, Dorelia, and Augustus's portrait has a ton of character because he was a, you know, he was a very good portrait painter. But, um, but I favor Gwen Johns. Honestly, she, I think she's the far, far better painter. <laughs> and not only in this particular painting, but everything else that she, she did. It's a sad story because aside from being eclipsed by, by her brother, they both relied on, her brother less than her, but they both relied on, on uh, an American patron that they had that collected uh, both their work. Uh, and he loved uh, Gwen's work. And when he passed away when she was older, she was distraught. She, she had, you know, she had uh, no other avenues to... Um, to show her work or to live from her work. So it's that uh, realization that we have now when we can just very objectively look at somebody else's work um, and, and try to understand it, you know, within the times that they lived in, it, it, we realize that they, you know, went through hardships that we can't even imagine. Gwen John eventually just passed away uh, I think when she was fleeing, I'm not sure, when she was fleeing France uh, at the beginning, like right at the beginning of World War II, I think it was. And um, it, it was just very, very sad. Uh, the, just the, the, the last part of her life, she spent uh, uh, painting nuns. Uh, she was doing this commissions of um, nun portraits, which are absolutely fantastic. And this is my painting today. It's just... Um, just the tiniest way to to celebrate those nun portraits which are i think are brilliant and what she did and she obviously did just so much better than i could ever do in a couple of hours here but she worked within those compressed values so she she really really condensed uh her palette and her darks were never you know value zero if we're going from a, a grayscale uh from value zero to ten zero being our darkest dark her darks were probably value four, maybe, and um, or even five, four and a half, five. Basically, it was a painting that the darkest dark was uh, value four, five, and the lightest light was value three or two, uh, which is insane. It's uh, to me those are some of the most beautiful images I've ever ever seen. They kick me in the gut, you know, more than any other paintings really do. So this, this shortening of our palette, this willingness to work within all these values that are begging you to be atmospheric, to lose your drawing, to not do those very sharp drawing marks like I just did. But I was willing to pay attention and to say, yeah, if, if I'm going to honor this, if I'm going to do this correctly, I, I have to pay attention and I have to do this right. And I think it takes a lot of willingness to shut up and not <laughs> and not say anything and just listen to the painting it's so easy to always to always want to talk 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 and and just impose our point of view and just tell other people how wrong they are and how right we are 
and how much we know and how little they know. If we do that with other people, we are doing the same with our painting. We'll do exactly the same with our painting. If that's our nature as human beings, and if that's how we treat other people, that's how we treat animals, that's how we treat nature, and that's how we're going to treat our paintings. But if there's a willingness to listen, and to sometimes say, wow, this is what I know how to do. This is what gives me security. But this painting is asking me to give up that sense of security and to work, you know, in this sort of unknown path. And it is up to us to travel that path, you know, if we want to. What I can say uh, is that if you are willing to travel, the universe just opens up. And I'm sure that that path could be a super enlightening one for, for you. So that was, um, that was it for today. I think it's a, it's a very nice painting. I'm glad I was faithful to what you know, it was asking of me. So uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.